An important process with using steels is heat treatment and an important type of diagram for designing heat treatments is the time temperature transformation curve. So here we have time on the horizontal scale in seconds on the logarithmic scale. We have temperature on the vertical axis. In this case it's in centigrade. Now, the important elements of the, the curve shown are this nose shape here. There's three lines here showing the start of the transformation, the midpoint, the dotted line, and then the end, okay, the rightmost line of the nose. Then we have these horizontal lines which tell us when the martensite starts, when we have 50% martensite, and then the 90% Martin site. So the, the black lines on the graph are form what is known as the time temperature transformation curve. If the, the measurements were made through continuous cooling, so if we were taking the material up to a certain temperature and allowing it to cool, rather than keeping it at a certain temperature, and then seeing how much time it took to transform, then that's a different kind of curve. It's called a continuously, uh, continuous cooling transformation curve. But um, I'm not going to go into that much detail. The curves are very similar in appearance and the method of interpretation. But, but of course, the, uh, uh, the actual... Uh, shape of the line will differ whether we're continuously cooling or we've got an isothermal transformation. So how do we read this? Uh, how do we read this? On the uh, inside the uh, t to the right of the end curve here we have a description of what the final state would be. Oh, up here we're going to have perlite, down here perlite and bainite and bainite down here at lower temperatures. Here, this uh, in this area, we have austenite. As we go down here, we're going to see martensite. Okay. Now, these colored lines represent a heat treatment process. So let's have a look at number one. Number one is taking the material at above the eutectoid temperature, so it's all austenite, and then allowing it to drop precipitously, allowing the temperature to drop. When we do that, we miss the start uh, line for any kind of transformation, okay? Except, of course, when we go below the martensite start temperature, and then we start the transformation of martensite. And uh, we can see that here it's 50% transformed. So this tells us that actually at room temperature it is possible to have some what is called retained austenite present in the material. Now you may wonder why these transformation curves have a nose. Well the reason is, is that high temperatures, although uh, the kinetics, sorry, the, um, the diffusion is very fast, the, fa the reaction is not very energetically favorable, and so it proceeds sluggishly. Or perhaps I should say the rate is slow. At lower temperatures here, the reaction is energy highly energy is uh, more favorable, but diffusion is lower, hence we get a low reaction rate. Somewhere in the middle we hit, hit a happy median, where we have the maximum transformation rate. That means basically the material transforms into, it, into its final state into the sh uh, uh, after the shortest time interval. So that's why these curves here have our former nose. If we perform a heat treatment that avoids the nose, then we will not form perlite or bainite. Instead, the austenite will be transformed partially into martensite. And we can see one, heat treatment one, 
Heat treatment two, avoid the nose. Heat treatment three, what happens here is that we get 50% transformation into bainite. So this is the bainite zone right here. And then the austenite that's left, that is not bainite, is now going to cross the martensite start line. And we're going to get a mixture of bainite and martensite. Let's look at cooling curve four. At four, we're going to hold it at this temperature and we're going to convert it basically into perlite and then cool down. We're going to get almost all, it says here, fine perlite. So these curves are very useful for designing heat treatments. And we're going to look at some uh, six simple heat treatment processes uh, that are common in, uh, for the heat treatment of steels. And here they're shown differently. They're just shown as the, the, the for, for, you could program a furnace perhaps using these curves. They just tell you the time, oh sorry, the temperature um, uh, at which the material is kept for the time interval. So we see we ramp up to a temperature, we have a soak zone, and then we cool down. At lower temperatures, we're just using a stress relief at the lowest temperatures. Slightly higher, we're going to do a process anneal. That just removes the effects of cold work without changing the phase composition. At higher temperatures, um, we actually do start to uh, change the, uh, the, comp the phase composition, and I'll talk about some of those. So I talked about a process anneal, which is just used to remove recrystallization after cold work. An important process is normalizing. And this, in, this involves heating the steel until it consists just of austenite and then allowing it to cool rapidly in air, in air only, so it's not a quench. And um, in such cases, um, uh, certainly plain, plain carbon steels or steels that, that do not harden easily will form the pro-eutectoid pro phase, which may be ferrite or cementite, depending upon whether it's hyper-eutectoid or hypo-eutectoid, and then finally fine perlite. So that's normalizing. It puts the steel into a known state. Spheroidizing occurs at a temperature below the, this is the spheroidizing range here, below the uh, eutectoid temperature. And what that does is the, the um, cementite is transformed into spherical particles. And this makes the material easier to machine. So spherodized steel is easier to machine. Tempering heat processes can, uh, are when a quenched material is reheated to remove stresses and also to transform martensite into a less brittle and hard material, into transformed martensite. And historically, this has been done by watching the color that the iron oxide layer that builds upon the steel, once you polish it and then reheat it, attains. So if we take a piece of steel, okay, this is normalized steel, so it's uh, basically uh, the pro eutectoid and uh, and uh, uh, perlite. Let's heat it up to until it's all in the gamma phase and then quench it. Now we have a high level of martensite. If we heat it to just uh, 350 degrees centigrade, a straw color, it's partially tempered, a very low level of tempering here, so it will still be very hard. This is great if you want a sharp cutting tool, say a cold chisel for cutting metals, um, you may not need that such hardness, and it may be an impediment. It may be too brittle for applications such as woodwork, in which case you would temper it more. And uh, if you re really wanted to, if you really want to make a compromise and increase the toughness, you would increase the tempering. Uh, uh, and as and in doing so, you see how the color, the tempering color changes. Of course, uh, these days, in a modern process, you would not use color to uh, determine the, 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 uh, 
uh, the temperature. But um, you may enjoy this, uh, this video here. I've put a link on your notes and it shows how you know a craftsman might make a chisel. Uh, and uh, it shows the forging, the shaping. Here we're austenizing it, heating the, hot, the steel until it's all austenite. And now, interestingly, when it's quenched, only the tip is quenched. Only the, 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 the tip that would be used for uh, cutting the wood. And that's because we want that part to be very hard, but the rest must be tough. We don't want the chisel to snap in our hands. That's uh, not only dangerous, but makes the tool ineffective. So having done this, um, the, the tip is hardened and now may be given its final sharpened cutting edge. Of course, uh, when, when the material has been hardened in this manner, we have to be careful not to reheat the blade and allow it to inadvertently uh, soften. So, um, uh, uh, you know, abusing a chisel by putting it into a flame or something like that is likely to uh, result in, in, the, in an ineffective tool. We talked about how steels can be hardened by quenching. A, a, um, a systematic way of measuring how difficult or easy it is to harden a, a steel is the Jomini test. And this involves taking a, a specimen, a cylindrical specimen, and getting it uh, until it's red hot. There, there is a precise temperature, of course, to that. And then we put it in a jig where we spray water on the bottom. Pretty spectacular. And what that means is the, the, the quench, the rate of drop of temperature in, in the region where it's in contact with the water is very high. But then as we go up, the rate of cooling is less. So when we do a hardness test on the material, what, we do, what we're plotting here is hardness versus what is known as the Jomini distance, the distance from the quench zone here, zero. If we look at the, how the hardness changes, we can see how hardenable the steel is. A, this material here, the 4340 steel, its hardness doesn't change at all, as um, whether it's quickly quenched or slowly quenched. This means this material is very easy to harden. You don't have to do much. You just have to heat it up and let it cool down, even in air. So this, this can be a good thing if you're trying to have a hard material. But it can be a bad thing, um, too, if uh, you don't want to inadvertently result in a brittle material if you had to heat this material up. Um, we see here a plain carbon steel, a 1050. And we see how it takes, um, it only gets hardened in the, uh, in, in the region close to the, the quenched end. And so, you know, you could say that that's difficult to harden in a sense uh, in, in, um, in that one would have to take some special uh, methods to, to get the cooling rate such that uh, the material hardens. We're going to now look at some uh, specialty steels uh, that are used in, uh, in cars. So far, we've looked at steels that are single phase, and what I mean by that is um, uh, they could be considered, you know, of one type uh, all the way through. But um, uh, there are some interesting steels called dual phase steels, where we deliberately want to create um, uh, a mixture of phases that are not normally seen in typical steels. So one type type of dual phase steel is uh, is well. Uh, th this dual phase, uh, d what are known as dual phase steels, consists of a of a distribution of ferrite and martensite. So imagine that the ferrite is very soft, and um, uh, distributed within that is martensite, which is very hard. Now, because the ferrite is soft, the material overall is very easy to shape. So if you're trying to make a car body panel, so here we have some components in the in pea green that have been made using a uh, 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 dual phase steel. So, okay, now we've shaped them. Now we want our hardness back, all right? Or we'd like to make it strong because the stronger the material, the less we have to use of it in the car, which 
means that the car can be lighter, but in fact modern cars are much heavier than, pre than uh, cars, say, from the 1970s, okay? Um, in terms of, you know, for, of comparable size. And um, the, the reason for that is safety, okay? There have been, uh, the safety requirements on cars has increased uh, substantially, and so we have to use more material. So to meet the safety standards, you, the car makers have to be very smart, otherwise they end up with very heavy, inefficient vehicles if they don't use specialty steels. So the dual phase steel being used here, here you can see in the roof ribs, etc., and the, the shown in pea green. These steels consist, uh, like I said, of ferrite and martensite. They're shaped, and uh, there is the shape because of the high ferrite content. But once they're shaped, they are baked. And baking, what that does, that allows the carbon in the martensite to come out and harden the, uh, the ferrite material. So this is a bake hardenable alloy. Another um, important uh, specialty steel is the uh, TRIP steels. And the acronym stands for Transformation Induced Plasticity. These type of steels consist of continuous ferrite with a dispersion of a harder phase, martensite or bainite, and some retained austenite. So remember from the TTT curve, we showed that uh, the transformation of the steel, uh, of the austenite, is often not entirely complete, okay? Um, particularly for... Uh, um, uh, carbon levels above 0.3%. Uh, um, now, what these, what trip steels, how they work, is that the retained austenite is in a metastable state. If we take a sheet of this material and we bend it, the austenite gets disturbed and it turns into martensite, okay, which is one step more stable. This, of course, results in a very hard, strong um, material where it's deformed. This is perfect um, for uh, applications, uh, a number of applications here, and particularly what this perfect for is crash resistance, because what happens in a crash? Massive deformation of the metal. Now, if deforming the material makes it harder and stronger, that very act, and this, this effect is amplified beyond what you normally expect from cold working. By transformation, uh, by a phase transformation, we can get uh, very, you know, improved energy absorption uh, characteristics from the steel. And we see the trip steel is being used here in the, uh, the crash absorber at the front of the vehicle here. So, uh, yeah, that's a very interesting topic, and uh, I urge you to do some research about that. Next thing we're going to talk about are cast irons. Commercial cast irons have carbon contents between 2% to 4%. Actually, 4.3% you see here, up to the eutectic. Let's see what happens if we just take some molten, uh, some melt, with a carbon composition within the cast iron range and let it allow it to cool. Okay, so we're cooling down here, it's liquid here. And now here we start to getting some gamma phase forming, austenite. Okay, great. Now the liquid heads towards the eutectic. When it does so, it splits into austenite and um, uh, uh, cementite. This eutectic is called ledeburite. Okay, that's the deburite. Now, as the eutectic cools, the austenite that's contained in there will turn into perlite, and the rest of it will be cementite. And what you, what you end up with is a material with a matrix of cementite, this hard, brittle material. So this will be very hard, but it'll be brittle, with um, enclosing regions of perlite. Okay. And this kind of material is called white cast iron. So this is very easy to make. Just take some melt, let it cool down, 
you know, pretty fast. Let it cool down quickly. And uh, if it has a low silicon content, it will turn into white cast iron. White cast iron is, uh, doesn't find many uses because it's so brittle. But um, it does have very good wear resistance from its hardness. So it's um, used for, say, rollers, for rolling mills, of, of, um, for rolling steel components, because the surface is, um, uh, is particularly you know, for the surface, to, make, to have a hard, hard surface. And it's used in certain kinds of plumbing where you want extreme chemical resistance or resistance to um, um, chemical attack. So this type of uh, plumbing is, is quite expensive actually. And if we took a sledgehammer and we just hit this, it wouldn't dent, it would just smash, like, like almost like as, as if it were glass. So, it, and when it cracks, it will have a bright white surface, a bright silvery surface, I would say. Yeah, it's silvery surface. Um, and, uh, and that's the reason it's called white cast iron, because of, because of that fracture surface. So, okay, so what can we do with cast iron? It's, uh, we've got white cast iron, it's got lots of this cementite here, which is, the cementite is the problem, that's what makes it brittle. How can we get rid of that cementite to return to give us a malleable material? Well, if we take into account that cementite is actually metastable, and if we heat treat the material, it will revert to its uh, a more stable um, composition of uh, or, or uh, okay, I'll call it composition. Uh, more, more, more stable chemical state for this system would be to split into ferrite and graphite. So I've annotated the previous diagram. Instead of just saying gamma and cementite, I'm going to put cementite or graphite, and I've done the same here. So if we heat treat, we can convert our cementite into, into graphite, okay? And the, the iron uh, will... Uh, Oh, f sorry, in, in, we can convert the cementite into ferrite and graphite. Okay, ferrite is malleable. The graphite may not be a problem. Let's, uh, you know, and in fact, we can create what's called grey cast iron using this approach. So with grey cast iron, what we do, we have moderate cooling. This allows the cementite to break up, basically disassociate into flakes of graphite, so we have flakes of graphite, and then the ferrite absorbs the carbon, and um, uh, eventually, um, eventually, well, well the, the, the ferrite turns into arsenite, which turns into perlite. So we end up with perlite with graphite rosettes. So you're seeing these things that look like flakes, but they're actually three-dimensional ob um, kind of objects called rosettes. And um, uh, so, one of the one of the things with grey cast iron is that these flakes are have sharp ends on them, and they act as stress concentrators. This means the material is still brittle. If I take a piece, if I take a piece of uh, grey cast iron and I hit it very hard with a hammer, it will crack. Okay, and when it cracks, you've got a nice dull gray surface and that's why it's called gray cast iron so what can we do we've still got a real material a lot better than before stronger than before but still not good enough okay but actually one beautiful thing about perlite uh, politic perlitic gray cast irons is they're, they're they're pretty strong and they absorb vibration very well so and they're great materials for machinery bases and stationary engines. In fact, uh, cast iron was as was used for car engines for, for quite a while until uh, um, you know the last maybe a couple of decades or something. Well, last decade perhaps. Yeah, I'm not sure of the exact date when the changeover. But the, you know you can still find new car engines that are made out of cast iron. For instance, this Chrysler 5.7. Hemi engine block is uh, made out of grey cast iron and uh, they are uh, legendary for being a very quiet. 
So the problem with these grey cast ions is that you've got these graphite rosettes that act as stress concentrators. What can we do about that? Well, um, we could improve matters, improve ductilities, du um, ductility by heat treating further and allowing more time for the carbon to come out of the perlite. Yeah. The, so the cementite in the perlite, what we do, we take the carbon out of that by through heat treatment and allow it to uh, disassociate into ferrite and uh, graphite. So now we can have a ferritic gray cast iron. Ferritic gray cast iron, because it basically consists of ferrite with graphite rosettes, this is now a malleable material because ferrite is malleable. So this can be easily shaped. It's, uh, it, it can be tough. Obviously it's not strong as perlite, but uh, this is a, you know, this material can find wide, wider application. Another way we can make cast irons ductile is to poison the growth of those, um, those uh, rosettes by adding magnesium or cerium which changes the the graphite morphology from flakes and rosettes to uh, nodules, these rounded nodules. So these can be political, um, and that's called ductile cast iron. And so even the perlitic cast iron, if you add magnesium or cerium, can be made ductile. And uh, if we heat treat, if we heat treat perlitic, perlitic uh, ductile cast iron, the carbon comes out. Uh, of the perlite, leaving it as ferrite, and just making more graphite. So we end up with a ferritic ductile cast iron. Another thing we can do to make uh, cast irons malleable is to heat treat white cast irons. And with increased heat treatment, the cementite starts to break down into ferrite and uh, graphite. And with a high level of heat treatment, we can um, uh, change the morphology of those rosettes so they don't act as stress concentrators. So here's a, a nice overview from your textbook about the processes involved um, to, for, to make these different kinds of cast irons that we talked about. An interesting type of cast iron is called aus tempered cast iron. Now, instead of having um, a politic, politic cast iron, what we want, we want the, the eutectoid phase to be the tougher um, bainite. So what we do, we heat treat the material. Here, this uh, using the TTT curve to demonstrate what happens. The heat treatment is along the red line of the cast iron. So we take it up to temperature. It's all austenite. We lower it. We lower the temperature. And then um, we, at this point, the material is easy to shape. Okay. And because we, because we have a, a lot of austenite. And then we, at low temperature, a relatively lower temperature below the nose here, we allow it to transform into bainite. So now we have a bainite matrix with graphite. So this has excellent uh, properties and uh, you'll, you'll see here is an aus tempered ductile cast iron suspension arm for a Ford Mustang Cobra for instance. The final topic for steels is our stainless steels. Uh, stainless steels contain uh, at least 11% chromium and what that does it forms a passivation layer of chromium oxide when it's exposed to oxygen. You see um, iron when exposed to oxygen forms iron oxide that's great but the problem with iron oxide is that it continues to be porous and it it allows oxygen and oxygen isn't real, the, the real problem here the problem is things like contact with water, for instance, and that results in oxidation of the material of, of iron. It rusts, basically. 
What we want is if the material is going to react with the environment, that the reaction products form a coherent film, a thick, strong film. That's what happens with materials such as aluminum. Aluminum is actually quite a reacting material, but it forms a coherent oxide layer that prevents further attack. Yes, and that layer is called a passivation layer. So if we put chromium in the steel, it will form... Chromium is, is lucky in the sense that it does form a passivation layer. So that's what the chromium does when you put it into steel. It forms a passivation layer that prevents further attack from the environment. And that's the secret of stainless steels. And there are different types of stainless steels. There are ferritic stainless steels. These contain up to 30% chromium. So this tells you why stainless steels are expensive, because we the alloying is heavily alloyed um, materials. Yeah, so that's why they're expensive. And uh, ferritic, so the, the addition of these alloying components uh, st produces a lot of ferrite in the material. So the, these stainless steels, as you would expect, have uh, good ductilities, okay, and, uh, and they're going to be magnetic. And you see here a typical application is uh, panels for cooking surfaces like this, okay, so flat panels where you not, don't have to do a lot of uh, um, shaping etc. So uh, panel on your fridge for instance, on a, on a fridge would be a ferritic stainless steel and it would be magnetic. If you need a harder, materi a harder material then uh, we can create a martensitic stainless steel. Okay. So these are, as because they're modern site they're very hard and they're used for things such as uh, bearings and high quality knives. Modern Citic stainless steel is also magnetic. So with the addition of nickel, this stabilizes the austenite phase. And uh, so, and this means that we can have a, a stainless steel that is almost all austenite at room temperature. The fact that it's austenite and which it has a face-centered cubic structure, that makes it easy to form. So if you have to do a lot of stamping and shaping of a, of a stainless steel component, you want to use an austenitic stainless steel. So here, the kitchen sink here is made out of an austenitic stainless steel. Another interesting thing is that uh, we know that austenite is not magnetic, so austenitic stainless steels are non-magnetic, but they can be uh, become slightly magnetic after cold working. That's uh, oh, I have one more to discuss: the the uh, the duplex stainless steels, and these contain a mixture of ferrite and austenite phases, and. Uh, these are used for things such uh, um, as we can see they have excellent corrosion resistance and uh, they use for things like uh, high pressure piping and uh, here these uh, chemical processing environments where you've got reagents at temperature. So that was just an introduction to stainless steels to round off uh, this uh, this module. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it and uh, I've, I hope I've been able to uh, increase your appreciation of, of the m amazing material that steel is. Thank you very much.